Welcome back to Lit for Brains. Today's video is going to be on Plato's The Republic, book two. And this one, of course, is an interesting one. <laughs> they all are from Plato's Republic. So let's take a leisurely stroll through this book and see what we can learn here. If we recall the previous book, book one, we had that argument, what is justice? And Thrasymachus came up with that famous line, justice is the interest of the stronger. Might makes right. And in the beginning of book two, we have Glaucon, who is an amazing orator, an amazing rhetorician. He just does an amazing argument here. And he says, Socrates... I'm not satisfied with Thrasymachus, his argument, I'm not satisfied with yours. Nobody is arguing for justice for its own sake. Everybody just argues, oh, justice will get you this, it'll get you honors, it'll get you a good reputation, all these different things. It's all about, or maybe in the afterlife, things will be okay for you. So it's all about what justice can give you. But I'm not satisfied with that, Socrates. I want to hear justice being argued about for its own I, I want an argument for justice for its own sake as a virtue that it should be pursued in and of itself not as a means to an end and seeing as you Socrates you have spent your whole life doing this full time I expect to hear something great from you so what I'm going to do, Glaucon says, I'm going to argue for injustice. I'm going to do it as persuasively as I can, and then I want you to knock it down. And boy, does Glaucon argue very persuasively. He begins by saying that injustice is the natural human good. It's, it's what we all want to pursue. It's where our desires lead us to do, to do unjust things. That's, that's what we want to do as human beings. And that the greatest human good is to be able to do unjust acts and to be thought just and to not have to deal with any punishments for your injustice. That's the greatest human good you can strive for. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, the worst thing that can happen to you as a human being is to suffer these acts of injustice without any recourse, any retaliation, any chance for revenge. So the best is to do injustice and the worst is to suffer injustice without, without recourse. And justice is something that we do as a necessary compromise between these two extremes because no one wants to do injustice and suffer the punishment for it and no one wants to have injustice done to them and not be able to see the, see the person who did the injustice punished. So we have laws and we have covenants that we enact and we agree to create a society that is based on justice, even though no one is really getting what they want. And that's how Glaucon begins his argument. And to back this up, he uses the invisibility ring of Gyges, that story about the man where the earth split open and he found a ring and he puts on the ring and it makes him invisible. And the argument, he says, is that when we have this ring, the first thing we do, we think of all these unjust things that we can do, all the things that we can get away with if we become invisible. And so he uses that Glaucon to argue for our natural propensity, our natural disposition for injustice, how it's, it's our natural state that we pursue and we seek injust, injustice because of what we would do if we had that invisibility ring. Glaucon's brother steps in at this point, Adimantus, and he says, well, you forgot this other thing. He steps in and starts clobbering justice even more and says, well, what about rich people, people who have this, all these honors and reputations, and what's more, they can sin and then they can repent because they are rich. They can buy the best animals for sacrifices at the temple. And they can just keep 
sinning and then offering sacrifices, sinning and then offering sacrifices from the fruits of their injustice. And they're even beloved by the gods. Priests come knocking at their door and say, oh, give us some money and we'll say some magical spells and incantations for you and all your sins will be forgiven. So there's another benefit to, to injustice that Adimantus brings up. Oh, and Socrates is like, wow, that's, uh, these are some good arguments here. So, all this being said, for injustice, now, Socrates has to fight for justice here. He says, I don't feel that it's in my power to argue here. He's very modest, but anytime justice is being wrongly spoken of, I have to come to the rescue. One more thing. Glaucon sets up a thought experiment, a very important thought experiment. Let's give a man perfect injustice, and then let's take another man and give him perfect justice, and see where their paths lead. The perfectly, inju the perfectly unjust man will have all types of worldly successes and riches and he'll have a reputation as one of the most just people because he can cover his tracks well when he does something wrong he can just recover and everyone will believe him to be good and just and he'll live a good life that's injustice then the just man who doesn't care about reputation or honors just wants to be just for the sake of justice well where does that lead him well he'll be reviled, he will be demonized, he will be tortured, whipped, burned, eyes burned out, and at the end impaled. And that's the, the, the fate of the just man. This is the argument that he makes. Which direction do you want to go? Another pretty strong blow against being just. So that's what Socrates has to contend with. Do you want to put yourself in his position in this, in this situation? That's a, that's a tough argument. It certainly is. So Socrates says, okay, you look at an eye, you see a letter and it's really small, but if you blow up that letter, you make it big, it's easier to see. So we're going to do the same thing with justice. Instead of looking at justice on an individual scale in one person, let's zoom out and look at the state, community. Why does a community exist? A community is created for the needs of the people that make it up. A minimum of about four or five people. And there's a division of labor. Everybody does what is necessary for the community based on their natural skill set. You've got a farmer, the husbandman. You've got the weaver who makes clothes. You have the shoemaker, the cobbler who makes the shoes. And a few other things. Of course, you will need a carpenter to make instruments for the farmer. You'll need a merchant because you have to import these these things and in general you'll get by and you'll live a good life you'll have nice food you'll have nice family you'll enjoy life and that's all you need but then and that's and that's a just just life but then human desire comes in and we want more and we want more and we want more so we'll start needing luxuries we'll need luxury foods We'll need really nice furniture, perfumes, incense, things like that. We'll need actors, musicians, poets in our society, entertainment. And eventually, because other societies will be near us, our neighbors, they're going to want to expand too with their unlimited human wants. And they're going to want our territory. We're going to want their territory. And so eventually we will have to go to war. So we'll need full-time guardians, people in the army. Their entire job is just to de defend the city against these other communities that have rapidly expanding wants. And now the question is, what character traits do they have to have? Now you might be noticed something interesting about this. Socrates, as he keeps going on and on and on, more questions. And then you get you answer that question, and then another one. And I. I compare this to a philosophical meat grinder. I mean, you put one question in, you drop it in, what is justice? You start grinding what is justice, and out comes the question in, in 500 different pieces, 
and you've got 500 questions from there and all of a sudden you're asking what is a state what is justice in an individual what is justice in the state what do we need for a guardian and then once we do that we'll, we'll put the question back into the meat grinder and that'll come up with another one and i feel like this is to add infinite ad infinitum it just goes on forever and ever you just keep asking questions and keep asking questions keep digging and keep digging and and it's beautiful it's a beautiful exploration it just doesn't end that can be very good if you are an inquisitive person if you need concrete answers it can drive you mad and if you have both of those personality traits you like exploring and then you like concrete answers both well then it'll be a very interesting it'll be a very interesting time for you studying philosophy so so we start with what is justice and now all of a sudden we're asking what qualities do we need in a guardian so the main quality is fierce to enemies and gentle and kind to friends but wait socrates says where do you find this nature people who are gentle and kind they aren't good guardians people who are extremely fierce well, they destroy themselves and they destroy people around them before, before anyone else, any enemy can intrude and destroy them. So how do you combine these two qualities? How can somebody be fierce to enemies and gentle to friends? Well, it's a tough one, but he does mention dogs. I mean, he, the animal kingdom. You go to dogs, they're very kind to their owners, their masters, the people that they know. And they see a stranger sometimes and they'll start barking. So you have that quality existing in nature, so it can be done in, in a human being. And now we go back to the philosophical meat grinder. Well, how do we educate such a person then? How, now that we've found out what qualities he, ha he has to have, how do we educate him? <laughs> so then he starts talking about the nature of the gods and how in, in plays like Homer's plays, you have Homer's, sorry, not Homer's plays, Homer's poems, he, epic poetry, he describes the gods as fighting with each other, quarreling with family and friends and them amongst themselves. Well, we can't share that. We need to censor that when children are of a young age. We need to convince mothers and nurses to teach them that type of, that type of story. But of course, don't confuse this with censorship in the late stages because once once our guardian gets to a certain age well then he can be exposed to more of these stories because then at that point he can tell the difference between allegor what's allegorical and what's literal but in the beginning you have to you have to be considerate about what you're sharing with them and you can't tell lies about divinity so here's another question <laughs> back to the meat grinder what's the next question the next question is what is the nature of the gods that we need to that we need to share first thing socrates discusses is the gods or god is all good and god being all good you look at the world and you see that there is great evil this is called theodicy it's the it's the exploration of why does evil exist in a world where god is good and he says, he comes to the conclusion that evil must come from some other cause that is not God. Certainly an erroneous conclusion, but Western civilization has been built on that, this idea of this opposing force that is separate from God, as if God did not create absolutely everything. <clears throat> so in that sense, there is some disagreement there. But that's what he says, that, that that's what we need to teach our guardians, that only good things come from God. Nothing bad can come. Unlike in, in the poetry, as Homer's poetry, that Zeus gives men a mixture of good and evil. No. Only, God only does good things. We'll teach that to our guardian. Next, can God take human form? In these poems, we have gods taking on human form. Is that true? Do we, and we have mothers scaring their children, saying that gods walk around at night and punishing wrongdoers in human form. Well, no, God does not take on human form. Well done on that. 
So next question. <laughs> I think you get the pattern here. Does God change? Can God change? If God is all perfect, then any change from perfection means you're being less than perfect. You, you can't, once you've achieved perfection, there's, there's no change there. So, no, we teach that God never changes. I would say extremely advanced ideas by Plato and Socrates 2,500 years ago. Very big ones. And if we had lived by them as a society, things would be certainly better. <coughs> so, that leaves us with this is this is how the book ends this exploration of of god and justice and obviously it leaves us wanting more it leaves us it's not complete but that's for reading later in this book of the republic at the moment i will not be doing a book three that is not on the list next is aristotle but i recommend that you read that you follow along because these are the precepts that Western civilization was built upon. When you read the Republic, you basically have Western civilization in a nutshell. It's, it's a seminal work. It's like, the found, it's like a founding, one of the founding works of the society that we, that we live in today. Where does this all lead? Well, it all leads to justice being a good in and of itself. And I will add one thing here, and that is being at peace with yourself. That is the highest human good I have found. It's, it's peace. It's going to bed at night knowing that you're doing the right thing, that you're on the right path. And when you're going to bed at night and you're not doing the right thing, you're not on the right path, it can be a very hellish experience. And anybody who goes down that path of injustice, if you are not used to it, if you've had a taste of the just life and you start switching over to injustice, the agony can be severe and you lose peace. And that pain in and of itself that no matter what reputation you have no matter what people think of you if you know that you're doing wrong by your own standards by yourself under god then you don't have any peace people have learned to live without the peace but not if you've actually experienced it once you've had that then you can never go back and that's one of the arguments for justice that I was thinking about while reading this. So, we'll see you back here for Aristotle. <laughs> A very different philosopher than Plato, as we will see. Take care.